Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Google Cloud Next 2018. Brought to you by Google Cloud and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back everyone, it's theCUBE live in San Francisco at Google Cloud's big event Next 18. Google Next 18 is the hashtag. I'm John Furrier, Jeff Frick. Our next guest, Dave Renson, Director of CRE and Network Capacity at Google. CRE stands for Customer Reliability Engineering. Not to be confused with SRE, which is Google's uh, heralded program, Site Reliability Engineering, category, categoric changer in the industry. Dave, great to have you on, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so we had a meeting a couple months ago and, and, and I was just so impressed by how much thought and engineering and business operations have been built around Google's infrastructure. It's a fascinating um, uh, case study and history of computing. You guys obviously power yourselves in the cloud, is just massive. You got the site reliability engineer concepts that now is, I won't say uh, is a boilerplate, but it's certainly the guiding architecture for how enterprises are going to start to operate. Take a minute to explain the SRE and the CRE concept within Google. So I think it's super important that you guys, again, pioneered something pretty amazing with the SRE program. Well, I mean, like everything, it was just born out of necessity for us. We just, we did a calculation 12 or 13 years ago, I think. We sat down a piece of paper and we said, well, hmm, <clears throat> the number of people we need to run our systems scales linearly with the number of machines which scales linearly with the number of users and the complexity of the stuff you're doing. All right, you know, carry the two, divide by six, plot a line. In 10 years, and this is 13 or 14 years ago, we're going to need one million humans to run Google. And that was at the growth and complexity of, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, yeah. or 12 years ago. Search. <laughs> Search, right? Yeah. We didn't have Android, we didn't have cloud, we didn't have Assistant, we didn't have, you know, any of these things. We are like, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> um, we're going to have to do something different. And, and so that's kind of where SRE came from. It's like, how do we automate? The basic philosophy is simple. Give to the machines all, all the things machines can do and keep for the humans all the things that require human judgment. And that's how we get to a place where like 2,500 SREs run all of Google. And that's massive, and then the <coughs> billions and billions of users. Yeah. Again, again, I, I think this is super important because at that time, it's a, it was a tell sign for you guys to wake up and go, well, you can't get a million humans. But it's now becoming, in my opinion, what enterprise is going through in this digital transformation, whatever yeah. we're called it these days. Consumerization of IT now is digital transformation. Whatever it is, the role of the human-machine interaction is now changing. People need to do more. They can collect more data than ever before. It doesn't cost them that much to collect data. Yeah. We just heard from the big query guys, some amazing stuff happening. So now enterprises are almost going through the same changeover that you guys had to go through. And this is now super important because now you have the tooling and the scale that Google has, and so it's almost like they have to level up fast. So, so how does an enterprise become SRE-like quickly um, to take advantage of the cloud? So, you know, um, I would like to say this was all sort of a deliberate march of a multi-year plan, <laughs> but it wasn't, it was a little accidental. Starting two or three years ago, um, companies were asking us like, they were saying, we're getting mired in toil. Like, we're not able to innovate because we're spending all of our budget and effort just running the things and turning the crank. How do you have billions of users and not have this problem? We said, we do this thing called SRE, and they're like, please use more words. Yeah. And so we wrote a book, <laughs> right? And we like expected maybe 20 people would read the book and it was fine, and because we didn't do it for any other reason other than that seemed like a very scalable way to tell people the words. And then it all just kind of exploded. We didn't expect that it was going to be true, and so a couple of years ago we said, well, maybe we should formalize our interactions of like, well, we should go out proactively and teach every enterprise we can how to do this and really work with them and, and build that muscle memory, and that's, that's where CRE comes from. That's, that's my little corner of SRE. Um, it's the part of SRE that instead of being inward focused, we point out to companies, and our goal is that every firm from five to 50,000 can follow these principles, and, and they can. We know they can do it, and it's not as hard as they think, and um, the funny thing about enterprises is, is, is they have this inferiority complex, like they've been told for years by Silicon Valley firms, you know, in a sort of this derogatory way that you're just an enterprise, like we're the innovator. That's, buy our stuff, buy our software, you know, the, buy IT. We're smarter than you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's nonsense. Yeah. They're, 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 there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of really awesome engineers in these enterprises, right? Yeah. And if you just give them a little latitude, and so anyway, we try to, we can walk these companies on this yeah. journey, and it's been, I mean, you've seen it, it's just been ex 
snowballing the last couple of years. Well, the developers have certainly have changed the game. We've seen with cloud native, the role of developers being, doing toil and or, you know, specific longer term projects that an app you know, related IT would support them. So we had this traditional model that's been, been changed with Agile, et cetera, and yep. DevOps, so that's great. So, yep. you, know, you know, golf clap for that. Now it's like, well, okay, more than sca a golf scale, clap. It's, been real. it's been a high five. Yeah. Now it's like, they got to go to the next level. Okay, the next level is how do you scale it? How do I get more apps? How do I drive more revenue, not just reduce the cost? So, and now you got operators, now I have to operate things. So I think the persona of, what operating something means yep. is what you guys have hit with SRE and, and CRE as part of that program. And that's really, I think, the aha moment. So, so that's what I see. And so how does someone read the book, put it in practice? Is it a cultural shift? Is it a reorganization? What are you guys seeing? What are some of the uh, uh, you know, successes that you guys have been involved the, in? The biggest way to fail at doing SRE is to try to do all of it at once. Don't do that. There are a few basic principles that if you adhere to, kind of the rest of it just comes organically at a pace that makes sense for your business, right? The most, the easiest thing to think of is simply, if I did distill it down to a few simple things, it's just this. Any system involving people is going to have errors. So any goal you have that assumes perfection, 100% uptime, 100% customer satisfaction, zero error, that kind of thing, is a lie. You're lying to yourself, you're lying to your customers, it's, it's not just unrealistic, it's in a way kind of immoral. So you got to embrace that. Yeah. And then that difference between perfection and the, and the amounts, the, the closeness to perfection that your customers really need, because they don't really need perfection, treat as a budget. We call it the error budget. Go spend the budget, because above that line, your customers are indifferent, they don't care. Yeah. Um, and that unlocks innovation. So, so this is important, I want to just make sure I slow down on this. Error budget is a concept that you're talking about. Explain that, because this is, a, I All think, right. interesting, because you're saying, it's BS that nothing, there's no errors, because there's always errors, right? Sure. So you just got to factor in that and how you deal with them. Is, is, but explain this error budget. It's this operating philosophy of saying, deal with errors. So explain this error budget concept. It comes from this observation, which is really fascinating. If you uh, plot, say, reliability and customer satisfaction on a graph, what you will find is, is for a while, as your reliability goes up, your customer satisfaction goes up. Fantastic. And then there's a point, a magic line, after which you hit this really deep knee. And what you find is, is if you are much under that line, your customers are angry. Like pitchforks, torches, yeah. flipping cars, angry. And if you operate much above that line, they are indifferent. Because the network they connect with is less reliable than you, or the phone they're using is less reliable than you, or they're doing other things in their day than using your system, right? And so there's a magic line, actually, there's a term called an SLO, service level objective. And, the, and the, the difference between perfection, 100%, and the line you need, which is very business specific, we say treat as a budget. If you overspend your budget, your customers are unhappy because you're less reliable than they need. But if you consistently underspend your budget, because they're indifferent to the change and because it is exponentially more expensive for increment of improvement, this literally resources you're wasting. You're wasting the one resource you can never get back, which is time. Yeah. Spend it on innovation, and, and just that just that mental shift, that we don't have to be perfect, lets people do open and honest, blameless post-mortems. It lets them embrace their risk in innovation. You know, we go out of our way at Google to find people who accidentally broke something, took responsibility for it, redesigned the system so that the next unlucky person couldn't break it the same way, and then we promote them and celebrate them. Yeah. So you push the error budget, but then if you, you know, it's, it's basically a way to do some experimentation, to do some innovation. Safely. Safely, and, and what you're saying is, obviously the line of unhappy customers, you know, and it's like Gmail, when Gmail breaks, people are like, damn, oh, the world freaks out, right? But I'm happy with Gmail, <laughs> Gmail right now, it's working. But here's the thing, you Gmail know. breaks very, very little, very, very often. I never notice it breaking. Right, it, will you notice the difference between 10 milliseconds of delivery time? You know, no, of course not. You, now, would you notice an hour or, or whatever, whatever? There's a line, you would for sure That's notice. That's the SLO line. So That's exactly you're, right. You're also saying that if you try to push above that, it's cost more and there's not and you an don't incremental care. benefit. That's right. It doesn't affect me, my satisfaction. Yeah, you don't I'm, care. I'm at Nirvana now, I'm happy. Yeah. Okay. And so what does that mean now for putting things in practice? What's the, what's the ideal error budget? Is there, that's an SLO, is that part of the, the objective? Is well, that's, I mean, that's part of the work to do as a business, like, and that's part of what my team does, is help you figure out is, what is the SLO, what is the error budget that makes sense for you for this application? Yeah, and yeah. it's different, you know, a medical device manufacturer is going to have a different SLO than a bank or a retailer, right, and they're going to 
the shapes are different. And it's interesting, you know, we hear SLA, service level agreements, an old different term. Different things. Different things. Here, objective, if I get this right, it's not just about speed and feeds, there's also uh, qualitative uh, user experience objectives, right? So, it's, isn't it, is that, am I getting that right? Very much so. So, um, SLOs and SLAs get confused a lot because they share two letters, but they don't mean anywhere near the same thing. An SLA is a, is a legal agreement. It's, a, it's a, a contract with your user that describes a penalty if you don't meet a certain performance. Lawyers and sometimes sales and marketing people drive SLAs. SLOs are different things, they're driven by engineers. Um, they are quantitative measures of your user's happiness right now. And it's oh, exactly to your point. It's always from the user's perspective. Like, your user does not care if the CPU in your fleet spiked or the memory went up, usage went up X. They care, did my mail delivery slow down? Yeah. Or is yeah. my load balancer not serving yeah. things? So, focus from your user backwards into your systems and then you get much saner things to track. Dave, great conversation. I love the innovation. I love the operating philosophy because you're really nailing it in terms of you want to make people happy, but you're also pushing the envelope. You want to get these error budgets so you experiment and learn and not repeat the same mistake. That sounds like automation to me. Um, but I want you to take a minute to explain what SRE, that's an inward facing thing for Google. Sure. You are called a CRE, Customer Reliability Engineer. Explain what that is, because I heard Diane Green saying, we're taking a vertical focus, she mentioned healthcare. Seems like Google's starting to get in and applying a lot of resources to the field, customers. What is a CRE, what does All that right. mean? How is that part of SRE, explain so, that. So, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, when I was first hired at Google, I was hired to, uh, to build and run cloud support. And one of the things I noticed, which you notice when you talk to customers a lot, yeah. is you know the industry's done a really fabulous job of telling people how to get to cloud. I used to work at Amazon. Amazon does a fantastic job of telling people like, how do you get to cloud? How do you build a thing? Um, but we're awful as an industry about telling them how to live there. How do you run it? Because it's different running a thing in a cloud than it is running it on-prem. And you find that's a, lot of, that's a cause of a lot of friction for people. Not that they built it wrong, but they're just operating it in a way that's not quite compatible, right? It's a few degrees off. And so we had this notion of, well, we know how to operate these things at scale, that's what SRE is. What if, what if, we did a crazy thing, we took some of our SREs and instead of pointing them in at our production systems, we pointed them out at customers. Like, what if we genetically screened our SREs <laughs> for can talk to human, instead of can talk to machine, which is you know, what you optimize for when you hire an engineer. Yeah. Uh, and so we started Siri, it's this part of our SRE org that we point outwards to customer, and our job is to walk that path with you and, and really do it to get like, yeah. sometimes we go so far as even to share a pager with you. Yeah. Um, and really get you to that place where your, your operations look a lot like, like we're talking that same language. It's we, custom too, you're looking at their environment. You're oh looking yeah, at their, is that, that bespoke. And, and then we also try to do scale things. You know, we did the first SRE book. At the show just two days ago, we launched the, the companion volume to the book, which is like, um, cheap plug segment, where, um, it's the implementation details, yeah. right? The first book's sort of a set of principles, these are the implementation details. Yeah. Anything we can do to close that gap, yeah. where, I, uh, I don't know if I ever told you the story, but when I was a little kid, when I was like six, like 1978, my dad, who's always liked, loved technology, decided he was going to buy a personal computer. So he went to the largest retailer of personal computers in, in North America, Macy's, in 1978, <laughs> and he came home with two things. He came home with a huge box and a human named Fred. And Fred the human unpacked the big box and set up the monitor and the tape drive and the, and the keyboard and told us about hardware and software and booting up because who yeah. knew any of these things in 1978? And it's a funny story that you needed a human named Fred. My view is I want to close the gap so that CRE are the Freds. Got like it. in a few years it will be yeah. funny that you would ever need humans from yeah. Google or anyone else to tell you, to, to, to help it's you really learn how helping to run. people operate the, their new environment yep. at a whole, it's a new first generation problem, yeah. essentially. Well Dave, great stuff. Final question, I want to get your thoughts. Great, great to have this conversation. You should come in the studio, we'll go more and more deeper on this. I think it's a super important and, and new role with C SREs and CREs. But the show here, you, if you zoom out and look at Google Cloud, look down on the, on the stage of what's going on this week, what's the most important story um, that should be told and that's coming out of Google Cloud across all the announcements? What's the most important thing that people should be aware of? Wow, um, I have a definite set of biases, um, that won't lie. Um, to me, the three most exciting announcements were um, GKE on-prem, the idea that managed Kubernetes you can actually run in your own environments. I mean, people have been saying for years that uh, hybrid wasn't really a thing. Hybrid's a thing and it's going to be a thing for a long time, especially in enterprises. That's one. Um, I think the introduction of machine learning to BigQuery 
Like anything we can do to bring those machine learning tools into these petabyte scale. I mean, you mentioned it earlier. We are now collecting so much data, not only can we not, can, as companies, we can't manage it, we can't even hire enough humans to figure out the right questions. Yeah. So that's a big thing, and then selfishly, in my own view, of, because of reliability, the idea that uh, Stackdriver will let you set up SLO dashboards and SLO alerting, yeah. to me, that's a big win too. Those are my, those are my top three. Dave, yeah, great to have and you the on. New book. Our SLO at theCUBE is to bring the best content we possibly can, the most interviews at an event, and get the data and share that with you live. Fantastic. It's theCUBE here at Google Cloud Next 18. I'm Jeff Frick. Stay with us, we've got more great content coming. We'll be right back after this short break.